the first letter of John, chapter 1 and verse 8. First John, chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And our subject, as we come into this uh, book, is very simply a single study, overcoming sin. We have uh, been uh, looking at individual topics just recently on these Wednesday evening studies and including the love of Christ and various other richly heartwarming matters. But I'd like to turn this evening to the matter of overcoming sin. And here we have helps in the defeating of sin. Never underestimate the Apostle John. He has a style of writing in his epistles at any rate, which at times sounds a little simple, as though he's talking down, as though he's speaking to simple people. And that may lead us to underestimate the sophistication of the comments and the counsels, because as you go through John, there are some of the most sophisticated and unusual incentives to holiness and instructions for the pursuit of righteousness. And here we'll have quite a number. And it'll help us. I don't propose to consider the defeat of sin in one, two, three simple steps, but look at just some of the general incentives and counsels that the Apostle John gives through this first epistle. So let's without ado proceed. The first step, well they're not strictly steps, they're helps to holiness. But the first step or help to be considered is right here in chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Well, the first help, and a rather obvious one, but a most vital one, is, of course, regular confession. If there is regular, earnest, not mechanical, nominal, formal, but regular, earnest confession of sin, that is a powerful incentive to the avoidance of sin and to holiness. Of course it is. We have to face God. We have to face him regularly. We have to express our shame over specific sins and all our sins. And that is extremely uncomfortable for us. And so it's an incentive to us. And we take the matter of falling into sin much more seriously. But if repentance and confession of sin to God becomes a formal affair, it doesn't hurt us. It doesn't affect us, it doesn't really search us, or is no incentive for us. And with a light confession, there is not accompanying us it a pledge for improvement, as there always is if repentance is felt and sincere. So here in the ninth verse particularly, if we confess our sins, and the word translated confess means agree to, assent to, acknowledge all that God says about our sins. If we admit them, then we have to do that, acknowledge our sin. It's the result sometimes of conviction that God gives. Sometimes we have to examine our hearts methodically and review the day or the week. Otherwise we forget we are so foolish, we forget what we've done, what we've said. Any feeling of shortcoming or guilt or shame has worn off by the time we come to prayer. And so we have to examine ourselves and reflect and think. And it's an uncomfortable exercise. And then we have to specifically confess, admit to those particular sins and to the sin tendency also which is behind the sins otherwise we're deceiving ourselves we are not saying we have no sin what Christian would say to God 
he has no sin. But while we're not saying that or insisting it, we're doing the next worst thing, we're forgetting our sin and the need for repentance. And until there's repentance before God, we shut ourselves off. But this is another incentive and point from his communion and his blessing toward us. So it's foolishness as well as wickedness. With inner conviction to acknowledge and assent to and agree to the fact that we've sinned. No excuses. Even Christians make excuses. Sometimes believers say this to me. They say, this is my problem. I do this or I do that. But there's an explanation. There's a reason. And after all, in their mind, it isn't all their fault. It's to do with their background. It's to do with the example they've had. It's to do with the pressures they've been under and the difficulties. Well, when we confess sin to God, no excuses. It's our sin. We did it. No attempt to lighten the guilt and to blame it partly on something else. Just honestly and simply before God. And if you feel no shame, ask God to help you. To give you shame for that thing and think about it regret it and then see in your mind's eye Calvary's burden which is increased by our sin and pledge better so the first step for holiness is self-examination and confession of sin regular confession of sin and that's the counsel here if we confess our sin he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins but not if we don't confess them and sincerely and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness now a second step and uh, it's down here in chapter 2 and I read from verse 3 hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected hereby know we that we are in him now these of course are first and foremost great indications that we are saved these are marks of conversion or grace that John is putting forward but they also contain counsel for holiness and here is our second help or step we are concerned about communion with Christ and walking in his love and for that we need to avoid sin we need to be conscientious and serious about the life of holiness look at the feeling of the Lord if I may put it that way in these verses he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. It's not only the indication, the indictment of a false believer, but it's also a warning to true believers who merrily go along in the Christian life saying, I know him, but we don't know him because communion is fractured and broken. And we're not actually walking with him, even though we're believers, because things are going on in life which are shameful and shouldn't be, and are unconfessed, bad reactions to difficult situation, losing of temper, being irritable, snappy, being selfish, being lazy, being unkind, thoughtless, all these things. And they fracture our walk and our communion with the Lord. And so even we as believers may say, I know him, when there hasn't been confession of sin and a serious attempt to make good and to do better. But whoso, verse 5, keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. You'll have assurance and a sense of the love of Christ and you'll love him, you'll know that you are in him. So it's this desire for a close walk with Christ is a great incentive for dealing with sin and for walking in holiness. We want to express our love and devotion. We want to appreciate and admire him. Love his work. 
love his word, love his plans. Oh, see your debt to him and desire and value communion. And that's a great incentive to be much more conscientious about the walk of holiness. Now a third issue which is a help to us and it's down there in verse 13 of chapter 2. And you'll see the references to the warfare and to the devil. I write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. And in verse 14, I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong and the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. That's what it's all about, friends. My third step or help in encouraging holiness and striving against sin is that we must see the spiritual warfare. We are in a spiritual warfare. And we need to be aware of it all the time and wake up to it. This is a great battle for the soul. Overcoming Satan in our lives and his activity is our great aim. You have to see sin, our personal sin, as Satan's great triumph over God. He triumphs, or thinks he does, over God every time he brings us down into some sin, small or large. See the sin as deeply offensive and an act of hostility against Christ, your dearest friend. And when we see this in the context of the spiritual warfare, Satan's attempt to discredit God, Satan's attempt through us to hurt Christ, through our thoughtlessness and our ease in ease of sin, well, dear friends, that helps us to take this much more seriously. We're in a battle. And if we lose and continue in sin and don't control our sins, well then, uh, we shall be injured. There's no half measures in this. So, says the Apostle Paul, mortify the deeds of the body. Put them to death. It's martial language. Then also James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then you've got a respite to prepare for his return and the next onslaught of temptation, the next encounter with him. If only we would remember the spiritual warfare, it would help us to take the matter of resisting temptation and sin much more seriously. And then a fourth step, and I'm reviewing these things quite swiftly, or a fourth help if you like. And it's there in chapter 2 and verse 15 to 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's not a believer, but he may be a believer who's been ensnared into love of the world and it's spoiling his walk with the Lord. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The world, the source of so much temptation and sin. Sin arises from within us, is hurled in as fiery darts from the devil, the enemy of our souls, and it comes from the allurements of the world, gratifying fleshly lusts, and we have to be awake, coveting things, appetites for things, ambition which is driven by pride, a position for me, an advancement for me, something that gets me noticed or admired or standing above others, that type of ambition. Excessive interest in appearance. And then, of course, wrong sexual gratification. Don't weaken yourselves, friends. It is a battle. Love not the world. Don't spend unnecessary time in catalogues. 
because it takes you into love of the world and the things that are in the world. Don't esteem and admire worldly things over much. Have priorities for your love. You love God first. You love the family second. You love the service of God. You love the fellowship of God's people. Of course you can have a reasonable home and you can appreciate things and you can appreciate beautiful things and natural things and art and so on. But you've got to have a priority in your loves and nothing in the world must overtake the things that you must love most or they will become objects of idolatry. Ration worldly things. Strengthen yourself. Say, I could have this, but on the other hand, I will make do with that. And you strengthen yourself immensely by being reasonable and rationing your desires for worldly things and worldly comforts. And if we give way to ourselves, to whatever extent we can afford, we weaken ourselves considerably. That's all part of love, not the world. Be great stewards. Sense Satan's wiles and strategies to draw us more and more into worldly lusts. Love, not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And down in the very last verse of this first letter of John, little children, keep yourselves from idols. The same point. So that was our fourth help. Then a fifth help. And it's this. Value the goal. Your destination. The ultimate purpose of your Christian life. Chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So you see, if we think much on the goal, the place to which we go, the grand eternal future in the paradise of Christ and then after the last day and the return of Jesus Christ when we receive those glorious resurrection bodies in the rejuvenated, glorified, spiritualized earth for all eternity what an objective to contemplate and if we think of the holiness of that, those future days and the holiness of the paradise of Christ and God is gathering us in to make us holy to occupy a holy, perfect, wonderful place with wonderful people and of course Christ himself that is the object how can I sin on earth when I'm given such things how can I live on in the rags and tatters of undealt with sinful habits and tendencies. So here is the word of scripture. This is not my homespun psychology. This is the word of God. That if we have our minds and hearts on that future objective and place, then it will help us not to sin. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself as he is pure. So that's a wonderful incentive and help to value the goal. What keeps you going? If you're working away at something even in the world, which is difficult and requires discipline. You're on a study course, well you want to pass, you want to graduate. You may be on a particularly long study course, like the medical students, and they see all their peer group graduating in a way and there they are still studying and they draw their motivation from where it's taking them and what they're going to be enabled to do in the future and so on and it's the same with our spiritual walk let's have our eyes on the grand objective 
And that motivates and helps us and we'll keep ourselves pure. We're children of God going to the heavenly city. We must keep ourselves in courtship pure and hold our vessels in honour. We must keep ourselves pure in marriage and kind and considerate and supportive and never, never spiteful. We must keep ourselves pure in business and in leisure. Sometimes people say to me, you know, even when Christians play football, it can get pretty vicious. Well, if the word was competitive, we wouldn't mind. But vicious, that doesn't sound very nice, does it? Are there temper displays on a football field when it's Christians? Is there unpleasantness? Faces contorted in rage and fury and all the rest of it? I sincerely hope not. We keep ourselves pure in leisure as well as in work and business and social relationships because of where we're going. We'll look at a sixth help or step for holiness that we can see in these chapters. It's in chapter 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now you may have read that And you may have thought to yourself, probably not in the words I shall give you, but you may have thought, that's the Apostle John being a trifle elementary. It is such an obvious statement, you may think. Why, who doesn't know that? That whosoever committeth sin breaks the law. What an obvious thing to say. It isn't so obvious, actually. It is meant to jolt us. It works like this. Didn't you realise that that sin, that small lie, that loss of temper, that unkind word, that lazy opting out of something you should have helped your wife or your husband to do, whatever it was, that was a direct defiance of the living God. I never thought of it that way. I defied God. I shouted at God. I said, away with your law. That's what the Apostle's trying to get across to us. He isn't saying an obvious thing. He's saying, didn't you realize your sin was a defiance of Almighty God, your Lord and your Redeemer? And he's jaunting us. He's making us, helping us to see the seriousness of sin that we take so lightly. Because we commit it so often. And it's no longer that important. And our attitude has descended to the level of this. Oh, I wish I didn't do that. Or I could avoid that. Wish we didn't do it. Wish we could avoid it. We've defied God. And if we saw sin in those stark terms, we'd be much more careful about it. All of us. I don't mean this to sound absolutely deathly serious this evening, but listen, dear friends, that's the reality. And that's what this apparently, deceptively, simple verse means. It's jolting to us. Whosoever committeth sin, small or large, transgresseth also the law of Almighty God, under which human souls are condemned to eternal banishment. For sin, you must never forget, is the transgression of the holy, absolute law of the creator of all things. That's the effect it's meant to have. So the sixth step is to remember that sin is a defiance of God. And we don't want to do that, small or large. So we want to be conscientious in striving against sin. That's the sense Don't defy him. Don't anger him. Who is he? My God. And Christ his son. My saviour. My dearest and eternal friend. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit within. Because the smallest sin does that. So it encourages us to be much more conscientious. Here's a seventh help. And it is this. Simply, it's in chapter 3 verse 5. And you know 
that he was manifested, Christ that is, to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. But surely that's obvious, an obvious observation. It isn't. Again, it's meant to jolt us to a great reality. Ye know that Christ was manifested. He came into this world. He became incarnate and he went to Calvary. What for? To take away our sin. Not just so that we could be forgiven. So that we could be happy. So that we could go to heaven. But to take away our sin. Not so that we could be forgiven and then just go on living lightly and sinning through our lives, small or great sins, but to take away our sin. The purpose of salvation, the purpose of his coming, was to get sin cleansed out of us. Our forgiveness, yes. Our place in heaven, yes. Our acceptance with God, yes. But then the ongoing process of getting us cleaned out and holy and better. That's the whole purpose of his coming. And we're not letting him do that because we've lost our conscientious concern to get better and to fight sin. I hope not, but that's how it would be, dear friends. So, to remember that salvation, the purpose of it all, is my improvement. That's the aim, that's his plan, that's the high purpose for me to be set apart from the world. That's why he left glory, that's why he died, to accomplish the whole thing. My improvement as well as my forgiveness, that's why he remade me, to set me on the road of improvement. That's why he delights in me. He didn't come just for my forgiveness and leave me floundering to make me happy so we remember that as a help sanctification is the whole purpose of our salvation and then an eighth step and time is running out and it is this it's in chapter 3 and verse 9 we have new power with salvation just remember it we have tremendous power now that we're born again by the Spirit of God. Verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed, God's seed, remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, evident, displayed. And the children of the devil also. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. So you see, we have new power. We've been given a much more lively conscience. The mastery and the dominion of sin has been broken. And God, with his further help, gives us power and opportunity to overcome our sin. The Christian person cannot sin. We have to interpret that, of course. John has been telling us already that we certainly can sin. And he who says he has no sin is a liar. He's not contradicting himself. When he now says the Christian cannot sin, he means the Christian cannot sin easily. The Christian cannot sin comfortably. The Christian does not sin inevitably. He's got a conscience. He's got the help of God. If as Christians we get to the point where we sin easily, we've gone a long way in the wrong direction. And here is the reasoning, again in verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. There's a battle within. He's concerned for righteousness. For God's seed, literally God's sperma, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. And that cannot be destroyed. In other words, God has put in him spiritual life. And he'll take that spiritual life all through his journey, and into eternity. It's been planted in him. It cannot be destroyed. So there's no excuse for us to surrender to sin. We have spiritual life within us. We should repent. And call out to God for help. And he will revitalize the spiritual life within us. Don't let it die down. Strengthen yourself. 
Be conscientious. Watch your reactions because you have new power which helps you avoid sin. And then a ninth help. Is this all too many? There's lots of these suggestions in this first letter of John. But a ninth step or help. Well, be horrified at the idea of being a hypocrite whose profession is not matched by deeds. Chapter 3 and verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't let there be a gap between your profession and your performance. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So hate hypocrisy. Let your faith be belief plus action. Promise God and then carry out. It's the proof of your genuineness. Do good things. That's what the apostle has just spoken of. Verse 17. Whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? By the way, living a righteous life is not just a matter of avoiding sin, and confessing it and promising to avoid it. It's a matter of doing good. We've got to stop the negative, and do the positive. And if you do the positive... It helps you immensely in stopping the negative. If we were to concentrate only on the negatives, I must not do this, I must not utter a wrong, harsh, unkind word, I must not commit these negative sins, but we never did good works and helped people and did all kinds of good and kind and righteous and proper things, we'd make a very poor job even of controlling the negatives. The more you do positively, the more strengthened you are to avoid the negatives. It's all part of advancing and being sanctified and being a better person. So it's not just a matter of starting the day saying, Lord, help me to avoid my sins. What can I do today? What should I do better today? How should I help my wife, my husband, my children, my parents? What should I do in this situation, in that situation? And cultivating the eye for doing good. That's all part of it. You won't succeed with the negatives unless you follow the positives also. And that's implicit in these verses. And then I come to the last help, the last step. I'm going on to chapter 5 and verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Keep yourself. Keep yourself. <laughs> if I can tell you some ancient history... Back in the 1950s and before, and the 1960s, in pretty well every boy's school, every boy who didn't wear glasses had at a certain season of the year to engage in boxing. Surprising how many glasses appeared. <laughs> However, Everybody who didn't wear glasses had to box. And similarly, as you got a bit older and you went into national service, in the army, in the navy, in the air force, everybody had to box. Of course, it was amateur boxing, but the rules were rather different in those days from what they are today. You didn't have protective headgear as they do today. That came in, I think, in the 70s by which time it had been banned from the schools anyway. We have to be much gentler these days. And also you didn't have these giant, enormous gloves that boxers wear today. They were much, much smaller. And they weren't filled with latest technology, high energy absorbing substances. 
They were filled with a thin layer of horse hair. And so people punched harder and it felt worse. And if you learn nothing else in boxing, it was this, to keep your guard up. Because if you didn't, you would soon be sitting on the canvas looking rather bewildered. So you kept your guard up. And that's what this is saying here. What are we like, friends? People used to fail. To, I can remember in national service they would get a lot of youngsters in two teams. You'd be on one team or on the other team. And you'd see somebody who was quite handy. But dancing around with his just swiping away with no guard. And you'd wince and you'd think any minute he's going to get caught. And sure enough he was. And down he'd go. No guard. So you learn that to keep your guard up. And this is what chapter 5 verse 18 is saying. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself. He keeps his guard up. Now whether you wear spectacles or not, or whether you're male or female, this applies to us all in the Christian life. Keep your guard up. If you don't, you will surely fall. You will be wide open. We are very vulnerable. If you do not watch sin rising up from within and recognize when even from within your own appetites and desires you are under temptation. If you don't see sin, the temptation when it comes to you from without. So keep your guard up from temptation from the world and excessive desires, from the darts of Satan from looking at various pictures on the television or wherever that might be wrong and unclean and arousing in some wrong way. Don't be corrupted. This is a corrupt world. Or from friends. Come and do this. Come and do that. You see it in the book of Proverbs. In the early chapters. And the repeated parable of the influence of friends on the young man. Come and do this with us. Maybe good friends. On Monday night a good friend says, come and some leisure pursuit. It's clean, it's good. And there's another friend on Tuesday night and another friend on Wednesday night. And before you know it, your life is being ruled by other people. And there's no rationing of serious to leisure activities. And you're in a mess. And there's no devotions. And you're being tossed to and fro. Temptation comes in all kinds of ways. Time wasting or from courses. Sometimes people elect to go and study a course. And they haven't been careful. And that's a course which is full of iniquity. That's a course which means studying all the filth and the decadence of some particular period or area of literature which is foul be very careful be very astute pray for discernment ask advice you've got to keep your guard up in this world and if you've got plenty of money and you've got a holiday job vacation job or a serious job and money's surplus be very careful with a little bit of surplus money come a lot of temptations and lusts if you're not very careful don't trust your automatic response. Set out in the morning and say, my besetting sin, my besetting tendency to sin is this and this. Lord, help me, deliver me from temptation. And help me. And I will watch out. Keep your guard up. Or Satan will laugh at you. And it's a disgusting laugh. And a horrible laugh. And he knows he's got you. And he'll take advantage of you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You're vulnerable. Your soul is precious. And you are responsible for guarding it and watching and keeping. A call brings help. Watchfulness is our duty. Watch your weak spots. Watch vulnerable times. Watch your heart and what you're giving your love to. Watch your thoughts 
Don't let them be all selfish thoughts when you've got ten minutes to daydream. Watch your plans, watch your bearing, and your deportment, and your moods, and your words, and your work, and your kindnesses. Watch your humility, watch your service, watch your prayer life. Keep your guard up, friend. And all this helps us against sin. So that's our study. Confess your sins. Protect your communion with Christ. If you're conscientious, you'll have communion with him. Remember you're in a warfare. Love not the world. Remember your destiny. Then the law of God, don't defy him. Sin is serious. Remember the purpose of your salvation is for you to be sanctified, not just to be happy. Remember God has given you tremendous power and you have his help too. Remember that you don't want to be a hypocrite and that your deeds will match your words and then keep up your guard. Dear friends, the Apostle John's counsels for help in holiness. Let's close by singing the hymn number 400.